my journey didn't start quite as I had hoped on Thursday. And Friday, I was supposed to attend a conference in Minneapolis, but there was not the usual warmth that I was used to during my previous absences. Martha, my wife, took half a day off so that I would leave with pleasant memories that would accompany me all this time. But this time, her farewell was limited to a simple farewell kiss after which she went to work. Let me introduce myself. My name is Ava Bajar, although I am often abbreviated as Evan. I am 49 years old, and for 24 years, I have been happily married to my wife, Marta. We have two children, Ross, who is now 22 years old, and Amelia, who recently turned 20 years old. When the clock struck 3 o'clock in the afternoon, it marked the beginning of my journey leaving work. I went to the airport since my flight was scheduled for 6 p.m. I made it a rule to arrive at the airport in advance, not wanting to be late or nervous about missing the plane. In this case, everything was done flawlessly, and I waited an hour for the long-awaited announcement of the boarding. But luck, it seems, did not favor me as I learned that the plane arriving from Minnesota was delayed due to bad weather. An impending snowstorm threatened our path. Eventually, after a 45-minute delay, we were able to board the plane. When we were soaring in the sky, after about 30 minutes of flight, I noticed a barely noticeable slope to the left. At first, I never thought that a small change in the flight path was anything but an adjustment. But it soon became clear that a complete U-turn was taking place. Without delay, the pilot confirmed our suspicions. Due to a severe snowstorm, landing at the Minneapolis airport became impossible, and we had to return to where we came from. Once on solid ground, I hurriedly headed to the airline's check-in desk, wanting to change my plans for the upcoming morning. Fortunately, the staff was merciful to me, and I managed to get one of the last available seats on the next flight. Despite the inevitable defeat, upon arrival at the conference, I firmly decided to attend. When I sat down, a spark of hope flared up in me again. I didn't manage to get to the conference immediately. Reaching for the phone, I dialed the number of my contact person in Minneapolis to inform him of the imminent delay of my arrival. With politeness and regret, I conveyed the message that my presence would be postponed until the next day. Equally important, I left a detailed notification on my boss's voicemail so that he would be aware of the situation. Anxiously, I dialed the familiar numbers of my home phone, wanting to hear Martha's soothing voice. But to my horror, she didn't answer the phone. It was a little after 8 in the evening, and I noticed that the house was shrouded in darkness, and for some reason, Martha's car was not in the driveway. Perhaps she decided to extend her working day or have dinner at a nearby restaurant. Since our youngest child went to college, the house seemed deserted, devoid of its former lively atmosphere. Leaving my luggage in the car, I carefully made my way inside. To my surprise, the sounds of voices came from the living room, shrouded in mystery. I went to the source of the voices and soon realized that the TV had been accidentally left on. This circumstance led me to an unambiguous conclusion, Martha apparently returned home after her working day since I clearly remembered turning off the TV before leaving in the morning. Pressing the remote to silence the chatter, I began to search the house for her presence, hoping to find at least some signs of her whereabouts. Alas, no traces could be found. In anticipation and anxiety, I dialed her mobile phone number and patiently waited for her to answer. After several calls, she finally answered. Hello, darling, Marta greeted me warmly, recognizing a familiar number. In response to the affectionate gesture, I replied, Hi, honey, where are you? It was a simple, innocent question that had become familiar during our marriage. I asked it not out of obsessive curiosity, but rather out of sincere concern and interest. Where else? At home, watching TV shows, she replied, seemingly throwing a metaphorical bucket of cold water on me. At that moment, the fatigue from the long delay in the journey took its toll and made my mind freeze for a moment. All I longed for was to meet my wife, find solace in her presence, and share intimate moments with her, at least for a few precious hours. These desires were simple, but they were of great importance to me. Despite the setback associated with the flight delay, I felt lucky, believing that I would be given unexpected happy hours in the comfort of my own bed next to my beloved wife. In just 30 seconds, my satisfaction at staying at home was replaced by a wave of uncertainty. 
Instead of returning to the arms of a devoted wife after 24 years of mutual love and trust, I was faced with the shocking reality of lies and deception. It was an unexpected blow that took me by surprise and left me completely at a loss for words and actions. Did she really just cheat on me? Why did she decide to do this? It seemed that there was no logical motive behind her lies. Whether she was at work, in the company of friends, or in a restaurant, my silence must have been prolonged because Martha's worried voice broke through it. Darling, are you still here? Waking up from my reverie, I stuttered, Uh, yeah, sorry. We've landed in O'Hare, and I have to go. With a heavy heart, I abruptly ended the conversation by hanging up the phone. Almost immediately, the phone rang again, but this time, I decided to ignore it and turned it off completely. I needed solitude or respite to sort out the confusion of thoughts rushing through my head. Sitting on the sofa surrounded by silence and emptiness, I felt a terrible feeling of numbness envelop me. I was haunted by the question, why did Marta decide to deceive me? Perhaps, I reasoned, there was a plausible explanation behind this lie. Maybe she's preparing a surprise for me. Reflecting on her history, I remembered how four years ago, I myself organized a series of deceptions. It was in honor of our 20th wedding anniversary, for which I secretly organized a two-week cruise. To carry out this surprise, I engaged her boss and parents, and for a whole month, I created a whole web of false information, managing a complex tapestry of untruth with fine precision. The memories of this lie culminated on the day we went to Miami for the weekend, and it was only at the pier that I discovered the surprise, a couple of cruise tickets. Yet, despite all my efforts, I could hardly name at least one upcoming anniversary in the coming months. The closest events were my birthday and the 25th anniversary of our wedding, which was still 10 months away. In the midst of this confusion, one persistent thought crept into my head, which required attention, but I resolutely rejected it. It was a thought that I categorically refused to accept, not us. Others may find themselves in such situations, but not us. It's just unthinkable, and that, I told myself, was it? Realizing that my daughter, Amelia, might be aware of all the surprises and plans of Marta, I quickly turned on the phone and dialed her number from memory. Hi, Daddy, how are you? The voice of my beloved daughter came on the phone. Hi, baby, how are you? I asked with genuine curiosity. Amelia replied, Nothing special, Daddy. I've just finished doing my homework, and I'm watching TV right now. Feeling the importance of the situation, I cautiously asked, Did you talk to your mom recently, and she didn't tell you anything? Amelia replied, No, we had the usual weekly phone conversation on Sunday. With a glimmer of hope, I asked Amelia a question, desperately trying to find from her at least some information about the surprise that Marta could have prepared for me. Do you happen to know anything about the surprise she's preparing? Don't tell me what it is. Just let me know if your mom is planning something, I asked, my voice full of anticipation. Amelia's answer shattered my expectations. No, Daddy, nothing. Why do you ask? What is it? She asked, not realizing that I was so worried. Coming up with a weak explanation, I said, Well, she's been acting pretty weird lately, and I wondered if she was hiding some nice surprise, maybe for my 50th birthday. Amelia quickly dismissed the thought, saying, No, not yet, Dad. Didn't we celebrate your birthday last month? Having failed, I accepted the truth and wished my daughter good night. Good night, Daddy, she replied, dejected. I realized that there would be no surprise which I had hoped for. The question remained open, why would Marta deceive me? Possible explanations began to emerge in my head. Perhaps this is due to the upcoming promotion. That's probably how it is, I concluded, although I couldn't understand why she would lie. I considered the possibility that she was still diligently striving for this elusive promotion. Lately, she has had to stay late more than once because of her unwavering dedication to work. And yet, deep down, Martha knew that no promotion would outweigh the value of the time lost together. She understood that I really wanted her to shorten her working day so that we could spend more time together. It was a reasonable request that I was entitled to, and she understood it perfectly. Ironically, I was reminded of an important decision I made a few months before our 20th anniversary, refusing a promotion. 
it has been almost five years since I enthusiastically sought and successfully received an offer to take the position of Vice President of Finance in my company. But this position was associated with the need to travel frequently to the head office in Chicago for board meetings, as well as regularly visit various factories of the company throughout the country. At first, I was full of enthusiasm when I received a job offer, but Martha quickly sowed the seeds of doubt in me, forcing me to reconsider my decision. The instructive story of my colleague did not fit into my head. He went through a divorce just two years after receiving the position. Although financial success was a reward for him, he had to pay for it with loneliness and suffering. Given the circumstances, as well as the fact that our two children still needed guidance and support throughout the remaining years of school, Marta, for obvious reasons, did not dare to take on this responsibility alone. During the week, we conducted active discussions, analyzing the possible consequences of agreeing to an increase. Gradually, it became clear that I was on the verge of losing sight of what really matters in my life, my wife and children. Having regained clarity, I made a sincere decision to refuse the promotion, recognizing that my devotion to my family takes precedence over material success. The last few months have been difficult, as Mara has been pushing hard for her promotion. It caused me anxiety and discomfort, reminding me of the doubts I had about my own career growth. Since our children were already in college, our family consisted only of the two of us. If Marta considered her possible promotion relatively feasible with minimal impact on our lives, for example, with an increase in the number of business trips, then I was worried about how many hours of overtime I would have to spend to achieve it. The fact that I saw my wife for only an hour or two a day throughout the week caused me a feeling of dissatisfaction. Fleeting moments of living together did not bring satisfaction, and the lack of quality time spent together weighed on my heart. The deterioration of our intimate life could not go unnoticed. Martha was increasingly drawn to work, and she spent Saturdays and even Sundays in the office. When she returned home, fatigue consumed her, leaving her no strength for anything else. It has become rare, if not impossible, to remember the last time we made love. Three weeks ago? Last month? Concrete details have become a depressing blur. While acknowledging that age played a role in the weakening of our physical bond, it was hard to ignore the pathetic lack of intimacy we once shared. Perhaps her deception during the phone conversation was an attempt to avoid my claims, hiding behind business obligations. But in fairness, I must admit that I was also on a business trip and realized that from time to time I had to work overtime. At the same time, there was an easy way to find out the truth, picking up the phone. I dialed Martha's direct line number at the T-Bold Advertising Agency. To my surprise, her colleague, Jake Turnbull, answered the phone. Frightened as I expected to hear Martha's voice, I quickly gathered my thoughts. Although they didn't work in the same room, I knew Jake was trustworthy, and he could confirm Martha's presence. Hi, Jake, this is Evan, I greeted him using my nickname. His answer was unexpected. Hi, Ivan, why are you calling me at work when you and your wife should be enjoying a vacation together? I was stunned and puzzled by his remark. Obviously, something was wrong. That evening, I found myself in a maze of surprises. Vacation? What kind of vacation? I quickly came to my senses, apologized to Jake for interrupting his work, and came up with a false excuse. Hi, sorry to bother you at work, Jake. I probably made a mistake with the speed dial button on my phone, I lied. He calmed me down without worrying at all. No problem, Evan. Just tell Martha that she owes me lunch when she gets back next Monday for filling in for her again. Can you imagine? It's nine in the evening, and I'm still working. She definitely owes me, he said, ending the conversation and hanging up. Gradually, the truth was revealed to me. Martha not only did not work but was generally absent from the workplace. According to Jake, she took a vacation until the end of the week. Panic slowly crept into my consciousness, squeezing me tightly as fear took hold of me. Where was Martha? What could she do? An uninvited but silent thought invaded my consciousness. No, it couldn't be true. I've always tried to see only the best in people, keeping a positive attitude and appreciating the kindness inherent in every person. But now, against my will, I began to think about the worst-case scenario. Is this really possible? Could Martha betray me in this way? 
the thought that she might be with her sister, Nadia, involuntarily crossed my mind. Over time, we distanced ourselves from Nadia and her ex-husband, Mike. Once we were incredibly close, we were bound by strong friendships that seemed indestructible. Our lives were intertwined in a beautiful canvas of shared experiences. We spent evenings together, supported each other, looked after the children, arranged numerous family holidays, and even went on vacation together as a whole. But everything changed one fateful day when I returned home with an excruciating headache. In search of relief, I swallowed a couple of Tylenol tablets and lay down on the sofa. Half an hour later, Marta and Nadia returned from a shopping trip, talking animatedly. Unaware of this, I remained unnoticed on the couch. Suddenly, Nadia started talking. Have you noticed the new product manager at the grocery store? My heart was pounding. I was anxiously waiting for Martha's answer. She calmly replied, of course, he's cute, if I may say so, and then anxiously remarked, and he smiled at you. It would be better if he was smiling after yesterday's rendezvous in the back seat of my car, Nadia exclaimed defiantly. To my surprise, my wife replied in a disapproving tone, Oh, Nadia, not that. One day, you will be caught, and you risk losing a good husband, and maybe even more. Nadia, not at all embarrassed, answered confidently, Don't worry, big sister. I'm always careful with these words. They abruptly left, leaving me in a state of uncertainty. As a person who values honesty and decency, I had a hard time coping with the weight of this revelation. Not knowing how to do the right thing, I found myself at a crossroads. One thing was clear, Mike deserved to know the truth. The news of Nadia's infidelity would undoubtedly break him, and my heart ached at the thought. I knew perfectly well that Mike, having found out about her infidelity, would not hesitate to throw Nadia out of their house. The burden of the potential destruction of their marriage was on my conscience. Did I really want to be the cause of such a major change? Before I had time to make a final decision, my wife returned home with our children. I consoled myself with the fact that she did not approve of her sister's actions, realizing that she had her own thoughts on this matter. By a trick, I decided to postpone making a final decision on her. That evening, when we were getting ready for bed, I touched on this topic, seeking her advice. Honey, I found myself facing an incredibly difficult choice, and I really need your advice, I began cautiously. Let's pretend I overheard a conversation today. When I explained the situation to Martha, informing her about the discovery of the fact of infidelity in our environment, her expression betrayed the initial uncertainty. What should I do? I asked seriously. Expose the cheater? Should I feel anger towards him? Martha thought for a moment, carefully considering the various circumstances that could accompany such a situation. Well, she began slowly, it may depend on the specific circumstances. Maybe this is a one-time mistake, or maybe a mistake made under the influence of alcohol. There are many factors that need to be taken into account. Feeling the need for further clarification, I suggested some alternative scenarios for the convenience of discussion. Let's say, for example, that this is our friend Mike. Imagine that he picked up a woman in a bar, and this behavior is not unique, he has cheated before. Should we turn a blind eye to this and ignore it? I asked, wanting to know her opinion. The gravity of the situation hung in the air while I considered possible options for action. From a sudden realization, Martha sat up abruptly in bed, clutching the phone tightly. Bastard, she growled angrily. It was obvious that she felt it necessary to take immediate action and tell Nadia about the betrayal. Instinctively, I carefully picked up her phone and said, let me figure it out for myself, honey. This is my responsibility. Doubts arose in Martha's mind about the correctness of our decision. Are you sure this is right? What if, she asked without hesitation. I confidently replied, yes, I am sure. I hope Nadia throws this bastard out of the house. Martha looked at me, determination flashing in her eyes. And we won't let him live with us, she confirmed. Agreed. He can find another place for himself. I don't want to shelter a cheater in our house, Martha said firmly. Fortunately, luck was on my side. Mike picked up the phone. Hi, this is your beloved son-in-law, I began with a heavy sigh. Mike replied with a light sense of humor, you're my only son-in-law, so I think by default you're my favorite. 
What's so important that you're calling so late? Taking a deep breath, I cautiously continued, I overheard a conversation today, and I have some truly terrible news for you. This is the news that will destroy your world, I warned him. Unfortunately, your other half is not quite right. To be honest, your spouse is cheating on you. It happened just yesterday. There was silence on the phone while Mike pondered this terrible statement. When he finally spoke, his voice was barely audible. Disbelief sounded in his words. I can't believe it, he managed to say. Doubt flashed in his tone. Are you sure it's about my Nadia? Confirming his worst fears, I replied, yes, I heard it directly from her mouth. To call it a confession would be an exaggeration, rather, it was a boast, devoid of any hint of remorse. Expressing my regret, I told him, I am very sorry that I became the bearer of such terrible news. I believe that you will handle this in your own way, but remember, do not hesitate to contact us if you need support or someone to talk to. We will help you and the children, Jamaica assured me. But before I could utter a word, he hung up the phone. Martha looked at me sadly, with tears in her eyes. I'm so proud of you, honey, she whispered, her voice filled with both sadness and admiration. Overwhelmed with emotion, she asked, Hug me, please. I feel so lost and scared. Hugging her, I gently rocked her back and forth, giving comfort in the face of uncertainty. After a moment of calming down, I asked a question that had not left my head. Do you think maybe they should see a therapist? I asked, interested in their possible further actions. Martha felt tired and muttered sleepily, I don't think it will change anything. Who was changed once always changes. Realizing the grim truth in her words, I quietly whispered, you're right. The ringing of the phone woke me up, and I answered sleepily, trying to keep my voice down so as not to disturb Marta. Yes, hi, I muttered, stifling a yawn. A wave of anger swept across the line as Nadia's furious voice lashed out at me, demanding answers. You bastard. What did you say to Mike? She snarled. I answered calmly. I told him the truth, Nadia. Only the truth. I glanced at Marta, who was already fully awake and looking at me with a mixture of concern and determination. Gathering my thoughts, I continued, Martha and I discussed it tonight and came to the conclusion that it's better to be honest, no matter how difficult it is. There was venom in Nadia's voice. I can't believe that my own sister can betray me. In response, I firmly said, well, sometimes the truth comes out even from unexpected sources. She was on the verge of telling him herself, but I took her phone away from her. We both agreed that cheaters should be held accountable for the consequences, whatever they may be. Nadia's tears began to flow uncontrollably, and she confessed through sobs. Mike kicked me out of the house. Unwavering in my position, I replied, if you are kicked out of the house, then this is a well-deserved punishment. Nadia begged desperately, but what should I do? Where should I go? Can I come to you? With regret but with firm determination, I replied, no way, Martha and I have discussed this too, and we don't have the slightest chance of granting asylum to a traitor. You have to get out of this situation yourself. I can't believe my sister would say that she loves me, Nadia exclaimed. Clearly not believing her ears, she sought advice. I turned to Martha with a question, Martha, what are we going to say to a cheater who asks to visit us after she was kicked out? With a sly smile on her lips, Martha leaned over the phone speaker. There was a hint of satisfaction in her voice as she defiantly stated, I don't want to see a cheater in my house. Get lost. I quickly put the phone back to my ear, deciding to speak on behalf of both of us. Consider this a message from both of us. I began firmly, making it clear that I would say these words only once. You are no longer a part of our life. Stay away from us. Don't come and don't call, I said firmly and abruptly interrupted the conversation. Martha snuggled closer to me, and we sought solace in each other's arms. I'm proud of you, honey, Martha whispered, expressing her admiration for how I handled the situation. In the end, fatigue overcame us, and we fell asleep peacefully. But the morning brought the inevitable storm. As the old Scandinavian saying goes, got into the fan. Fortunately, our children were still peacefully napping. Martha's father called early in the morning, and Martha answered hesitantly. There was anger in his voice, he was shouting at his daughter. 
A wave of anxiety washed over Martha, and her once bright smile faded, replaced by the power of anxiety. Tears were streaming down Martha's face as she finished the phone call. What have you done? What is it? She asked, her voice full of anguish. Sensing her confusion, I gently intervened. No, my love, it's not me alone. It was our common decision. We discussed the possibility of seeking advice and breaking off the relationship with the deceiver, which you suggested, and I wholeheartedly agreed. Martha seemed stunned. But you said Mike cheated on Nadia, calming down, I explained, as an argument, I mentioned a hypothetical scenario when Mike picked up a woman in a bar. I did not claim that he really cheated on Nadia. After reflecting on the situation, I asked the thought-provoking question, in any case, how does Mike's potential betrayal differ from Nadia's infidelity? Well, Nadia is my sister, Martha replied, defending her. I sounded disappointed. So you're saying that you can cheat on her because she's your sister? Is this some kind of family exception? Should I be worried? Martha was speechless for a moment, seemingly unable to find what to say. Taking a deep breath, I continued unequivocally, expressing my opinion. Honey, let me be clear. Your sister is a bad role model for our children. I don't want her around them, and I don't want you to have anything to do with her. She has no place in our house or near our children. This crucial conversation took place three years ago. Although Martha sometimes met her sister secretly, it was an unspoken taboo in our house. The fact that she secretly visited Nadia while I was away from home did not come as a surprise to me, and I accepted that our relationship remained strained. But over time, Mike managed to overcome the situation and began a new chapter in his life, preparing for remarriage. Along with his steadfastness, my resentment towards Nadia also dissipated. To tell the truth, I simply stopped caring about her presence, and I found joy in her absence. Turning my attention to Martha, I gently asked her, Martha, we need to resolve this issue. Maybe this is not a very pleasant topic, but if we clarify it, we will feel easier. I guess that Martha must have felt guilty for deceiving me, even though I had already reached the point where I didn't care. Over time, an amazing turn of events occurred. Discovery I was standing on the stage in front of a huge crowd of at least a thousand participants of the Congress. They appeared to me as nameless persons, as an anonymous mass awaiting my conversion. Taking a deep breath, I started to perform. Research has shed light on two different types of people in the field of tissue use, I began addressing the attentive audience. There are deniers, those who do not pay attention to the fact that they blow their nose, getting rid of napkins without looking down. And there are those who meet reality face to face. Intrigued, I continued my speech, delving into the behavior of these two groups. The first group, the deniers, I explained, just blow their noses and throw away a napkin without thinking. They prefer not to face the reality within themselves. Suddenly, someone in the crowd frantically waved his hand, attracting my attention. It was Dave Millicent, Martha's boss. Curious, I turned to him. Yes, Dave, what would you like to share? A mischievous grin played on his lips. Well, let me show you, Evan, how to face reality, he said. To my surprise, Jake Turnbull, who was sitting right behind Dave, stood up with a cheeky grin and added, Me too, Evan. I confess I also evaded your wife. Stunned, I looked around, but then another man I didn't know joined us, proclaiming, I'm three. Laughter erupted throughout the crowd, engulfing the hall. However, the unknown man quickly explained, No, not really. I just always wanted to say that. Light laughter filled the space, creating a moment of general fun. A sea of unfriendly faces grinned, forcing me to rise abruptly from the couch. Damn, I muttered, wiping saliva from my face and gathering my thoughts. Looking at my watch, I realized that it was already midnight. I must have slept for over an hour. The thought flashed through my mind that Martha could have returned home during my sleep, perhaps unaware of my presence since I was not expected there. Walking briskly towards the bedroom, I entered it but found no traces. Then it dawned on me that she was most likely with her sister, Nadia. Thinking about contacting Nadia and finding out about Marta's whereabouts, I hesitated. But then it dawned on me that if I knew Nadia's address, then I would have to act behind Martha's back to get it. 
remembering that I was picking up Nadia's children from a certain place. I thought that maybe I still had Nadia's phone number. While preparing to search in the contact list, I noticed the Find My Phone app icon on my smartphone. A year ago, I installed it on both of our phones after I lost mine during a trip from New York to Cincinnati. Realizing its capabilities, I quickly opened the application. A few seconds later, I received data on the location of Martha's phone, Mills Lake. Perplexed, I asked, what could she do there? Nadia, on the contrary, was experiencing financial difficulties, so she could hardly afford to buy or even rent a cottage on Mills Lake. The situation was becoming more and more mysterious. Mills Lake was known as an exclusive residence, and the cost of cottages far exceeded the cost of our modest house. Using Google Earth, I carefully determined Martha's exact location. It turned out that she was in a secluded estate surrounded by an impressive stone wall. This discovery puzzled me. What could Martha be doing in such a luxurious millionaire's estate? The distance between Mills Lake and our town was an hour away, but the need to find out the truth forced me to act. At the same time, I understood that a direct conversation with her would most likely lead to a lie or evasion. I needed to gather irrefutable evidence before starting a conversation, no matter how hesitant I was. Overwhelmed with violent emotions, I quickly headed to the car. All the way to Mills Lake, I berated myself tirelessly for refusing to accept the possibility of the worst on Martha's part. Regret gripped me when I realized that I should have checked her phone's GPS locator from the very beginning, rather than looking for excuses for her lies. Uncertainty clouded my thoughts as I drove up to Mills Lake, not knowing my intentions and with an elusive sense of hope for a simple explanation. Nervously, I headed for the manor where Martha was, and the weight of anticipation weighed heavily on me. In front of me was a massive gate that blocked direct access to the estate where Martha was. I wasn't going to drive up to the house and buzz, showing my presence in search of a wife. After assessing the situation, I realized that parking by the road would attract unwanted attention and could lead to the appearance of security guards or law enforcement representatives in this elite village. After driving a little, I came across a modest wooden path where I prudently parked the car. When I got out of the car, I was overcome with uncertainty. How am I going to get around this towering wall standing between me and the truth? And then it dawned on me that the estate is adjacent to the lake, which means that it can be approached from this side. With renewed determination, I headed for the shore of the lake, my heart pounding at the thought of finding the entrance to the estate from this side. Finding a footpath leading to the lake, I cautiously headed for the shoreline. Not knowing which huge cottage Martha is in, I was counting on a repeated check of the GPS locator. In the end, I got to a luxurious mansion where several lanterns were still burning on the second floor, but on the ground floor, it was semi-dark. Only one curtain remained open, and one light poured out of it. In search of a vantage point, I came across a sturdy tree and climbed high enough to look inside. My gaze fell on a man in a white terry cloth robe, but I hardly recognized him. The man, who looked older than me, quickly disappeared from sight. A moment later, a woman appeared, instantly confirming my suspicions. It was Nadia. When she stood in an open housecoat sipping champagne from a glass, I could not deny that at her age, she was still attractive. The fragments began to form into a single hole, and I realized that Martha was really with her sister. This discovery did not surprise me. Knowing about the financial consequences of the divorce, it could be assumed that Nadia would be looking for a rich partner. But I couldn't help thinking that Martha had been dragged into a lifestyle that I didn't approve of and didn't want for her. When the events unfolded before my eyes, I witnessed a scene that did not leave me indifferent. The man I saw at the beginning came up to Nadia, his hands boldly explored her body. Then he took the champagne glass from her, imperceptibly throwing it aside. I had to get down from the tree and look away from this intimate display of my daughter-in-law's attractiveness. My sensitivity was prone to old-fashioned ideas in which love and intimacy were intertwined as the most important elements of a genuine union between a man and a woman. What I observed seemed to me completely devoid of love, lacking the connection and affection that I cherished. Even if I didn't like Nadia, I wouldn't wish such a destructive and empty existence on anyone. Feeling a little uncomfortable with the spectacle unfolding in front of me, I thought about getting down from the tree. But when the couple moved away from the window, I met Martha's gaze. She was sitting on a sofa in the distance, and her face was decorated with a stupid, intoxicated smile. 
My heart sank. Frozen in perplexity, her housecoat was open, revealing a view that sealed the fate of our marriage. From the growing shock, I took an indecisive step back but lost my footing and fell from the tree. The branches broke, softening the blow, and fortunately, I escaped with minor injuries. In a daze, I got to my feet, feeling like the old man under the weight of what I saw. I began to wander aimlessly, like a zombie lost in a deserted world. With tears in my eyes, I barely made my way to the car, limping, reflecting the deep pain that permeated my being. It wasn't so much the physical fall from the tree that hurt me, but the emotional loss of happiness and the loss of a loved one. In those agonizing minutes, the thought flashed through my head to break into the cottage, break down the door, and let out everything that was going on inside. But the sad reality of several years spent in prison for trespassing and assault quickly extinguished this desire. At night, alone with my thoughts, a whirlwind of emotions raged in me. Denial could no longer protect me. I was faced with the unforgiving truth. Against the background of an overwhelming sense of the severity of the loss, I was overcome by deep sadness accompanied by boiling anger. But I understood how dangerous it was to let this anger consume me, knowing that it could only further ruin my own life. Deep down, I knew that no matter how angry I was, I would never stoop to physically harm Martha. As events unfolded, I considered the possible options. One of the easiest options would be to go home, pack your things, and leave her. If we lived in a state where there is no fault of the spouses, if our incomes were separate, and if we did not have dependent children, then the divorce process would most likely go smoothly. We would just divide the property equally and say goodbye to each other. But despite such simplicity, some part of me craved retribution, a sense of justice. The desire to take a little revenge did not leave me, forcing me to move forward. An audacious idea took hold of my thoughts, and without hesitation, I decided to take advantage of the moment and see how everything would turn out. Gripping the phone tightly, I dialed Martha's number, expecting that she would not answer and I would be switched to her voicemail. I was hoping she'd check her voicemail right away, just in case. Hi honey, I began, projecting my voice onto the answering machine recording. You didn't pick up your home phone, so I'm calling you on your mobile. I wanted to warn you not to panic when you hear the sound of my keys in the door in a few minutes. Amid the chaos of a blizzard distracting our flight and the uncertainty of the arrival time, I prepared a message for Martha. It was a crazy evening, I began, listing the difficulties we faced. Our plane was diverted to Chicago, but now we are finally being sent home. They don't know exactly when we'll land, but I should be home in about 30 minutes. See you soon. Knowing that Martha was to receive notification of a new voice message, curiosity and anxiety undoubtedly gnawed at her until late at night. It was unusual to leave a message at such a time, which only intensified the intrigue. I imagined her reaching for the phone, going to her mailbox in anticipation, hoping for luck. I silently prayed that Marta would be drunk enough and not pay attention to the fact that I could not use my mobile phone on the plane. Panic was growing inside her, she realized that she could soon get caught in her insidious web. In a rage, she was probably thinking about how to get ahead of me as soon as possible and return home hastily dressing and answering questions from her sister and lover. My thoughts were suddenly interrupted by my own phone, bringing me out of my reverie. Without thinking about the consequences, I hurried to answer, instinctively realizing that she might be trying to determine the time of my arrival. Hi honey, I began with fatigue in my voice. I'm sorry if I woke you up. It's alright, she replied, trying to keep her tone even. I'm on my way home. I'll be there in about an hour, give or take a few minutes. Martha confirmed my answer with a simple okay and then abruptly ended the conversation. Soon, I saw her car drive out of the gates of the estate and rush down the highway. My heart stopped when I saw her driving recklessly, almost sliding into a ditch. It became clear that she was in a much stronger alcoholic intoxication than it seemed to me at first. My anger and frustration intensified in March, but I quickly realized that her actions could lead to serious consequences, not only for herself but also for innocent strangers on the road. No matter how upset I was, I couldn't accept the thought that her life as the mother of my children was in danger. Having decided to ensure her safety, I decided to follow her, ready to intervene if necessary. Despite the resentment arising in me, thinking quickly, I dialed 911, and my voice sounded demanding when I told the operator, 
I want to report a drunk driver. The car almost collided with my car and then picked up speed and began to wobble recklessly, I explained. He just pulled onto the south side of the highway at Mills Lake. It's a dark blue Ford Taurus, and I managed to memorize the last four digits of the license plate. Someone has to stop this car before its driver does any harm. The operator thanked me for my help and assured me that a patrol car would be sent to detain an intoxicated driver. Keeping a safe distance, I continued to follow Martha, carefully navigating the traffic flow. Two exits later, I saw that a patrol car was approaching her location from afar. I noticed a patrol car parked on the bridge facing the motorway. As soon as Martha's car came into view, the patrol car sped up sharply, flashing lights signaling her to stop. I drove past them, experiencing a mixture of emotions, relief mixed with a deep sense of sadness. Forty-five minutes later, I returned home. The weight of the events of that evening weighed on me. It seemed almost ironic but at the same time an undeniable tragedy. In one night, the life of a man I deeply loved could be reduced to a simple consequence. A dark realization settled in me, making me think that Martha's actions could have led to her death in a car accident and the subsequent grief and suffering of my children. I took a pause for reflection, to give vent to my fears, realizing the fragility and the jewel of life. My love for Martha was no longer taken into account in the decision I made. It wasn't that I stopped loving her, but that I could no longer imagine a future together. Taking drastic measures, I turned off the home phone call and turned off my mobile. I needed some privacy to sort out my thoughts. Reflecting on the hours spent searching for an explanation for Martha's deception, I realized that the most obvious explanation had been staring me in the face all this time. Disappointed with myself, I opened a bottle of wine and thought about the way ahead. For many years, I believed that my love for Martha would age like a good wine and eventually reach its peak. Now faced with the reality that our relationship has soured, I am confronted with the difficult question of what to do next. As the wine flowed and the night went on, I searched for clarity and direction among the mixed emotions that consumed me. The love that once flowed between us now seemed to have turned into bitter vinegar, leaving me in excruciating pain. The scale of her betrayal struck me to the core, but I was tormented not only by the betrayal itself but also by the realization that our love was lost. This love has defined me for the past 26 years, 24 of which I have lived as husband and wife. Without her, I felt adrift, like a lost soul devoid of purpose and self-awareness. Can I survive without this love? The pain grew stronger and stronger, forcing me to think about finding an end to suffering, perhaps to find solace in the depths under the edge of the bridge. I never thought that I would have to live without Martha. The prospect of starting life anew seemed insurmountable to me, and the path was full of uncertainty. How can you plan your life without a person who has become everything to you? From such a frightening reality, I was at a loss, not knowing where to start. The idea of making decisions without consulting Martha now seemed unthinkable. The simple truth was that family has always been at the center of my life. I carefully weighed my every choice, taking into account the well-being and happiness of my wife and children. Even our social life revolved around the needs of our family, so I hardly communicated with colleagues and other people. Although I attended mandatory work events such as the annual Christmas party, my priority was always to get home quickly. The number of times when I went beyond these obligations can be counted on the fingers of one hand. Over the past 10 years, I have recalled the times when we met with colleagues, but now that the kids are gone, it's just Marta and me. And now I found myself alone, immersed in my sadness. I had no one to love, no one to lean on. For the first time in my entire existence, Loneliness has become my unwanted companion. Why did she choose this step? Why would she cheat if a simple divorce would be more painful but at the same time more careful in relation to those years and joyful moments that we lived together? When exactly did she stop loving me? Did she tolerate our relationship only until our children grew up and moved away? When did her care and attention disappear? When our children went on their own journey, I saw it as an opportunity to invest more in Martha and our relationship, but I didn't know that she saw it as the end of our common path. I witnessed how a stranger was constantly with me. This indicated that they were comfortable with each other, or perhaps how easily deception penetrated into our lives. Martha and her lover leaving me in isolation without love made it clear to me that we are no longer a couple. In the midst of despair, my pain became a link with life for me. 
It served as a painful reminder of what I had lost, of the best moments we shared, and most importantly, of the presence of our children. In that moment of darkness, my children became my saviors, illuminating me with the light of hope. My self-esteem dropped so much that I didn't have the strength to pull myself out of the abyss of despair. My children came to help me, just thinking about them gave me a faint glimmer of self-preservation. Soon Ross and Amelia were to go on an independent voyage, to get their own families. In order to protect myself from the impending wave of grief, I realized that I had to distance myself from all this. It wasn't an easy task, but it was filled with pain. I understand that I will always keep the memory of Martha, of how I loved her, and at the same time, I will always remember her with another man. I needed to get out of this situation. Throughout my life, I have always been satisfied with modest expectations. Although my parents were not well off, I was lucky enough to grow up in a family where deep affection reigned. The material values that now surrounded me seemed insignificant in comparison with them. After reflecting on everything that belonged to me, I realized that clothes, a car, and a laptop are the only things worth taking with me. The more I thought about it, the clearer the way out of the predicament became. I decided to pack my things and disappear without a trace. I no longer wanted to look at the woman who was once the center of my universe. Just looking at her would only serve as a painful reminder of what I've lost and what's constantly hurting inside of me. With renewed determination, I rose from my seat, ready to act with a sense of urgency. I hurriedly collected several bags and started packing clothes. Surprisingly, everything about everything took only 30 minutes. Soon, I was loading things into the car. It was a little less than 6 in the morning when I finally finished packing. Exhausted but calmed down, I decided to take a little nap, being sure that Marta would still be in detox until late in the morning. When I closed my eyes, thoughts came into my head that I had to start all over again. The alarm clock on my phone woke me up at 9 a.m. Without delay, I arranged an urgent meeting with a lawyer. After that, I went to the shower to once again symbolically wash away the remnants of the past. With a heavy heart, I took off my wedding ring and solemnly placed it on the table next to the phone. This last act marked the beginning of my journey to a new chapter in my life, in which I sought personal liberation and happiness. I made the difficult decision to vent my disappointment in a letter addressed to Martha. Although we had reached the point where conversation seemed useless, I needed to vent my emotions. Martha, I am sad to admit that now I see you following in your sister's footsteps on the path of reckless promiscuity and loneliness that often accompanies her. Perhaps this is a hereditary trait, a sad inheritance. By the time you read this, I will have completely cut myself out of your life so that I will never cross paths with you again. The magnitude of your betrayal made me shudder with pain that I could not even imagine. The intensity of my pain is immeasurable. Despite all this, I am grateful for the 24 years of happiness that we once lived together and for the two beautiful children that you gave me. Trying to be fair and honest, I will be brief in this farewell. May you return to the arms of your beloved as soon as possible, leaving behind our ruined family. I am very hungry for justice, which you could not provide for me when you embarked on your dissolute adventures. Did you get a decent revenge for your actions? The man you were with, judging by the grandeur of the mansion, was very rich. I have no desire to see or talk to you anymore. We have nothing more to discuss. All the necessary procedures will be handled by our lawyers, and I ask you to sign the divorce papers without delay. As for the reason for our separation, it doesn't matter at all. By 10 in the morning, I was in the bank. I responsibly approached the repayment of our common credit card debt and promptly canceled the accounts. Having promptly taken measures, I visited the bank and asked to issue a cash receipt for the entire amount of our savings and securities. In addition, I made sure that there were enough funds left in the checking account to pay the mortgage and utility bills for the next two months. Taking another step towards independence, I deleted my name from the joint account. Leaving the bank, I was carrying a solid check in the amount of about $250,000. Before noon, I arrived at work, surprising my boss who expected me to be in Minnesota. When I told him the news of my immediate dismissal and relocation, his surprise increased. Our relationship has a unique meaning that goes beyond the typical employer-employee relationship. My boss holds his current position because I refused a promotion, and at first, he was not happy and owed me. But when he went through a divorce two years ago, 
I told him that this was the reason for my decision to refuse the promotion. Since then, our relationship has evolved from a traditional boss-employee relationship into a relationship of equal partnership. Listen carefully, he began. I understand your desire to resign, and I am ready to accept it. But instead of firing you through the HR department and writing a check for 401k, I offer an alternative solution. Instead, I have an interesting opportunity for you in our newly created optical division in Texas, he suggested. Although the salary may be lower than in your current position, I have heard that there are affordable housing options there that will allow you to provide yourself with decent housing at a great price. We sealed our agreement with a handshake, and he agreed to spread the word that I had voluntarily quit my job. The next step was to visit my lawyer and explain to him my decision to separate from Marta. Simply and clearly, I instructed him to hand her the divorce papers and issue a power of attorney allowing her to sell the house, which represents 50% of our total fortune. In response, my lawyer tried to convince me that the possibility of getting a consultation could be considered as an alternative scenario. Considering that he was also a close family friend, my lawyer quickly realized what changes were waiting for me. When midnight comes, I'll be in another city, in another state, and without a wife. In the afternoon, I set out, feeling an irresistible fatigue which prompted me to seek a respite. About 8 o'clock in the evening, I came across a fairly old motel. Naturally, you can't expect much from an institution with a price of $60 per night, but all I needed was a place where I could rest from fatigue. I dialed Ross's phone number using a disposable device I had bought earlier for exactly this purpose. Hello Ross, I greeted him when connecting. There was curiosity in his voice. What is this number, Dad? Please keep this number, I replied. This is my new phone number. By the way, is there any news from your mom? Ross replied, no. Taking a deep breath, I decided to be honest with my son. I found out yesterday that your mom was unfaithful, I said. Oh, Dad, not her, Ross lamented. Worried, he asked, and what are you going to do about it? With firm determination, I talked about what I had already done. It's all done, Ross. I packed up my things, cleared my bank accounts, leaving her enough funds until she sells the house. I quit my job, and now I'm going south. I'm done with her, I said firmly. I will give her the freedom to continue her business with her sister, but she will no longer be my wife. At the end of this week, she will be handed the divorce papers, I shared, and the heaviness of the conversation hung in the silence. Finally, Ross spoke, asking, does Amelia know? I said, no, not yet. It all happened so suddenly. You're the first person I tell. I'm not even sure if your mom knows that I left her. She wasn't there when I was packing my things. I will definitely keep you informed, I reassured him. I will call you regularly. I love you, son, Ross reciprocated. I love you too, dad. Take care of yourself. After finishing the conversation, I contacted Amelia. The conversation was marked by deep sadness. My children, with pain in their hearts, learned the truth about their mother's act and how it affected our family. Seeing what a destructive influence Nadia showed on her family, my children, like me, tried to understand how their mother could cause us the same pain. I was sure that Nadia had influenced her sister to do this to us, but Amelia, always outspoken, broke the silence by asking, how long has it been going on? How long have we stopped being enough for her? I reassured her that the duration and the reasons no longer matter. The important thing is that I loved her, trusted her with all my heart, and she betrayed that trust. Nothing else mattered now. Please don't worry, honey. I reassured Amelia. I'll be fine. I'm incredibly sad right now, but I'll get better over time, especially if I can keep my distance from your mom. I added that I would tell her my new address, and she would be able to come to me as soon as her school year was over. When I made this promise, tears welled up in my eyes. I wanted Amelia to know that there would always be a place for her next to me in Tucson. The optics division was relatively small and had only 30 employees. The district manager, who looked more like his father than a stern boss, created a sense of familiarity and comfort in the team. I immediately felt like a welcome guest, which brought me some comfort in a difficult moment. A month later, I found a pleasant house for myself in a condominium. During all this time, 
I did not maintain any contact with Marta, relying solely on information from my lawyer and my children. Moving forward was not an easy process, filled with its own difficulties. One case turned out to be particularly difficult. My lawyer informed me that Marta is ready to challenge the divorce. She declared her unwillingness to go through with the divorce and expressed her willingness to fight to the bitter end, even if it would mean financial ruin for both of us. In response, I calmly instructed my lawyer, Okay, forget about the divorce. I don't care anymore. I wanted to give her the opportunity to build her life after the 24 years of happiness that we once lived together. Just tell her that I have no desire to continue the relationship and tell her that I wish her a pleasant life, I asked, restraining my disappointment. And then tell her to go to hell. Can you deliver this message? My lawyer, realizing our close connection, replied, Of course, my friend. With pleasure. But I must warn you that you will have to pay an additional $50 for this. The conversation with the children turned out to be more difficult. One by one, I had to convince them that there was no getting away from this decision. The first obstacle arose when Amelia said to me, Dad, Mom completely lost her head when I said that I planned to live with you this summer. I promised Amelia that I would do my best to visit her as well as her grandparents, but her reaction was so alarming that I found it necessary to move away from my phone for a few days. Martha's behavior also worsened when Ross decided to split his summer between the two of us. As for Martha, I deliberately refrained from asking about her, preferring to focus on getting on with my life. Admittedly, it was not easy because the remnants of my feelings for her were still preserved, a mixture of emotions associated with our past life preceding the betrayal. But thanks to my children, I gradually learned more and more about Martha's state of mind. To my surprise, it turned out that she was going through a deep depression, mirroring the emotional shock that I once faced. It's just unbelievable, especially considering what happened to her sister. The concept is quite simple, when you cheat, it hurts the very people you should love, which leads to the destruction of your marriage. After that, you continue to live your life. So how could Martha be depressed if I did everything possible so that she could continue to live without my presence? Her refusal to divorce seemed to me a means of escape from reality, from the fact that her actions led to the disintegration of our family. Isn't it? For several hours, I myself was in a state of denial, but she has been living in a state of denial for the last two years. Despite the fact that she knew that the children maintained regular contact with me, she used our children as a means of expressing remorse for her actions. Thanks to the information shared by my children, I learned that this was the first time that she allowed herself, under the influence of her sister, to enter into an intimate relationship with one man. To be honest, it was hard for me to believe it. She apologized to the children, admitting that her betrayal was deliberate. She was well aware of the inevitable consequences that communication with Nadia, her lover, would lead to. Remembering that evening, she felt ashamed, hesitantly at first, but then to relieve her guilt, she succumbed to the craving for alcohol. Having received a voice message about my imminent return to the house, Martha had already finished her date, believing that a long-term repentance of betrayal and a declaration of love would help her to bring me back. She tried to convey this to me through our children. Through them, she tried to convince me that she was ready to do anything to prove her love for me. Although I understood that our children had hopes for reconciliation between us, I simply could not bring myself to agree to a conversation with Marta. The geographical distance between us was also a problem for them, as they had to make a choice between their mother and me. Marta has always been relentless in her quest to reveal my whereabouts from our children. All she knew was that I lived in one of the southern states. It's been almost three years since I left her, and finally, she managed to find out my whereabouts. One fateful day, leaving work, I saw her lurking near the office. I could not understand how she found out the city where I now live because I tried to keep this information in the strictest confidence. Based on what my children shared with me, Martha was sure that a personal meeting would be enough to change my mind. But I was determined to change her erroneous opinion. Quickly and unnoticed, I slipped out through the side door, my heart pounding. Picking up the phone, I dialed the right number, ready to take the necessary steps to protect my peace of mind. Hi Louise, I greeted, calling on the phone. Remember when I was talking about my ex-wife? Well, she's here, and it looks like she can follow me home. I just wanted to warn you. See you soon. Realizing my plan, 
I purposefully walked in Martha's line of sight, deliberately luring her to follow me. As soon as I pulled out of the parking lot, Martha caught up with me. To confuse her, I drove around the city for a while, stopped at the grocery store, and then returned to my home. When I got to the house, I parked at the house. Instead of keys, the door was opened to me by Louise, a beautiful Latin American woman of 30 years old. A few moments later, the doorbell rang. Louise, carrying a 12-month-old baby on her hip, quickly went to open it. From my place in the kitchen, I watched Martha's surprise at the sight of Louise. Hello, welcome, Louise greeted with a distinct Spanish accent. How can I help? Louise replied. Hello, I'd like to talk to Evan, Martha replied. At that moment, Louise called out to me from the doorway. Someone has come to see you. As if taken by surprise, I left the kitchen and allowed Louise to hand me the baby. Now you take care of your daughter while I finish cooking dinner, Louise said, her voice gentle and caring. Taking the child in my arms, I turned to Martha. Well, 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 I began, with a mixture of surprise and irony in my voice. I can't say I didn't expect it, but it's still quite a shock. I met her gaze, acknowledging the situation. You know, Martha, I really have to thank you for what you did. If you hadn't betrayed me, I would never have moved to this part of the country. I would have lived in the cold, surrounded by concrete in the Northeast. But now I'm here, living a new life, experiencing wonderful moments with Louise and her little daughter, Tamarita. There was a tearful silence. Martha openly cried, emotions finally spilling out after so many years. All traces of sadness and anger dissipated in me. As a compassionate person, I had a fleeting desire to comfort Martha, but it quickly passed. I was firm in my goal. So, Martha, I asked in a firm but attentive tone, what do you want? After almost three years of silence, she answered in a barely audible whisper, and I strained to catch every word. I need to apologize, she admitted. To tell you how deeply sorry I am for the pain I caused you. It wasn't you, it was my own stupidity. I want you to know that, no matter what, I loved you then, and I continue to love you now. You were the best husband and father a woman could wish for, and I was just, a cheap. Her sincere apologies began to affect me, but I understood that it was necessary to put an end to this farce as soon as possible. Well, it's okay, I replied, feigning joy. As they say, all this is water under the bridge. I haven't been fixated on these memories for so long that I can sincerely say that I forgive you. Looking at Tamarita, who was glowing with happiness, sitting in my arms, I said in conclusion, I sincerely wish you a happy life, a life filled with love like mine, I added, my voice filled with sincere feelings. Tears streamed down Martha's face. She muttered something unintelligible, hesitantly came up to me, hugged me, and hurried out of the house. I closed the door behind her, feeling relieved and sad. Louise came out of the kitchen, noticing my vulnerable state and sensing my need for comfort. She gently took Tamarita from my arms. I leaned against the closed door, giving way to tears. Moved by this sight, Louise hugged me tightly and kissed me gently on the forehead. With a determined expression on her face, she reached for the phone. I have to inform Horatio that I will be returning home with our daughter soon, she said, her voice warm and confident. Thank you, Louise. I whispered, sincerely grateful for her presence and unwavering support. Be sure to tell Horatio that I'll be waiting for you at the barbecue on Saturday, I said to Louise, my voice filled with enthusiasm. Absolutely, boss. I'll see you at the office tomorrow. The following week, my lawyer received the divorce papers duly signed by Marta. Moving forward, I realized that healing takes time and that it is necessary to find my own pace. I made connections with several female friends, entered into an intimate relationship with only one, but without any serious obligations. It seems that I am finally overcoming the pain caused to me. I became less afraid of women, stopped being so nervous and timid. Having realized this growth, I understood that perhaps it is time to give Louise the freedom of action so that she will bring me together with a kind and suitable woman. Trusting her opinion, I discovered the opportunity to meet a person who will bring true happiness into my life again. Now I'm reconsidering my decision after this unexpected meeting. Not that I'm leaving Marta because this choice remains unshakable, but that I had assumptions about the lack of common ground between us. 
I've always believed that we have nothing to talk about, assuming that she understands my position on infidelity and how I would act in such a situation. But listening to fragments of Martha's story during our recent communication, I doubt whether I should have come into conflict with her then, despite my dislike for this confrontation. But one thing remains indisputable, disappearing from her life was the best solution for me. This allowed me to find peace and restore myself away from the toxic environment that consumed us. I was so much in love with Martha that if I had run into her at that moment, I would most likely have succumbed to her remorse and accepted her apology. This could lead me to suffering and worries and eventually to divorce. But now that three years have passed since her betrayal and our separation, Martha's apology suddenly brought me a sense of completion. This allowed me to free myself from the pain that I carried inside me and gave me the opportunity to believe in love again. Over time, I might even consider revealing that I don't really have a second daughter, but I doubt that I will decide to do it. I don't owe her anything anymore, and the decision on whether to reveal or keep it to myself is up to me. I have finally freed myself from the burden of obligations to her, which allows me to move forward and start a new chapter in my life. But not for long. Yesterday, I stood at the grave of Marta with my children and numerous relatives, among whom was Nadia. I was crying bitterly like everyone else present, but I didn't see a single tear on Nadia's face. Martha, completely desperate in a drunken state, got into a violent accident. It was not possible to save her life. I thought for a long time about why Nadia knitted her sister into an intimate relationship with her lover and found only one explanation, it was revenge for the fact that Martha and I told Mike, her ex-husband, about the betrayal which destroyed their marriage. Probably only now Nadia feels relieved when her sister is lying in a coffin. And I know one thing, I will never love any woman the way I loved Martha.